want to welcome our second panel of witnesses. Um, as, I don't know if any of you were here for the first round, but we um, um, practice of the committees to swear our witnesses in. So if you will just stand up and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record show that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Okay, we'll go. You guys know the game. Uh, we have. Uh, well, I, I should introduce you. I apologize. Mr. Gordon is administrator uh, uh, for the Office of the Federal Procurement Policy, Executive Office of the President. Um, the Honorable Robert Peck is the Commissioner for Public Building Services, U.S. Uh, General Services Administration, and the Honorable David Michaels is Assistant Secretary for uh, Occupational Health and Safety, U.S. Department of Labor. Thank uh, each of you, gentlemen, for your um, uh, for your public service and your willingness to. Um, to be in front of the committee uh, today. And we will we'll probably, as you know, have members uh, join us. We, we hope so, and, but we'll, we want to hear your testimony. So let's go right down the row. Mr. Gordon, you are uh, you're up first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, other members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the regulatory implementation of Executive Order 13502, which governs the use of project labor agreements, PLAs in Federal construction contracts. I was pleased to sit in and listen to the first panel uh, with the diverse views that were expressed there and to hear the members' questions, and I will be happy to follow up with any questions you want to raise with me. As Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy, I am responsible for overseeing the development of government-wide contracting rules and policies and ensuring that those rules and policies promote economy and efficiency. This afternoon, I would like to briefly describe the steps my office has taken to shape the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or the FAR, as we usually call it, rule implementing the Executive Order. Let me first, though, address a misperception or a misconception about what the FAR rule says about the use of PLAs. Contrary to what the subcommittee members heard from some people earlier this afternoon, the FAR rule does not require the use of PLAs. Like the executive order, the FAR, rules does, uh, the FAR rule gives each contracting agency the discretion to decide for itself on a project-by-project -project basis whether use of a PLA will, in fact, promote economy and efficiency on a specific construction contract. The FAR rule calls PLAs, and I am quoting from the rule, a tool that agencies may use to promote economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. In offering PLAs as a tool to the contracting agency, the FAR rule on PLAs is similar to many other provisions of the Federal Acquisition Regulation. For example, the FAR lets contracting agencies decide, based on the specifics of their needs and their circumstances, whether they should purchase through the Federal Supply Schedule or rather on the open market, whether they should seek bids with price as the only evaluation criterion or, rather, run a competitive procurement with other selection factors, such as past performance or te technical excellence in addition to price. The FAR does not dictate to our acquisition professionals which choices to make. It gives them the tools to make the choices so that they can tailor a procurement to an individual agency's specific requirement. That toolkit approach and the flexibility that comes with it lie at the very heart of our ability to get the best value for every taxpayer dollar that we spend, whether we are buying lawnmower services or warplanes for the Air Force. Our approach to PLAs is no different. We have structured the FAR rule to create a process where decisions are made on a case-by-case -case basis. The FAR rule sets out factors that an agency may decide to consider. But it doesn't dictate the factors. It doesn't prohibit agencies from considering other factors. Among the factors that are named in the FAR are whether the project will require multiple construction contractors and or subcontractors employing workers in multiple crafts or trades, and whether completion of the project will require an extended period of time. As with other FAR rules, though, the PLA rule sets boundaries. 
Most significantly, the agency may require a PLA for a specific project only, only if it decides that doing that will advance the government's interest in achieving economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. But equally importantly, with respect to the content of any PLA created pursuant to the FAR rule, and this is particularly relevant in light of what the subcommittee heard on the first panel, the FAR rule requires that any PLA allow all firms to compete for contracts and subcontracts without regard to whether they are otherwise parties to collective bargaining agreements. This mandate ensures that if an agency decides that they should be using a PLA, it is done consistent with the principle of open competition, a bedrock of our Federal procurement system, so that all interested bidders are given an opportunity to have their offers considered by the government. We appreciate that taxpayers would not benefit from a rule that requires the use of PLAs regardless of circumstances. But we also don't think taxpayers would benefit if agencies were prohibited from taking advantage of opportunities where a PLA could help them achieve or increase efficiency and timeliness. With these thoughts in mind, my office intends to continue working with the agency, with the agencies across the executive branch to facilitate the sharing of experiences and best practices for the consideration and appropriate use of project labor agreements in the Federal marketplace. I will be delighted afterwards to answer any questions the subcommittee members have. Thank you. We will get it right. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Mr. Peck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and uh, other members of the subcommittee. I, too, heard the first panel, and I am happy to be here to uh, set the record straight and discuss GSA's measured business approach to the implementation of project labor agreements on our construction contracts. We share with you an interest in seeing that our construction projects are finished as expeditiously as possible and with the best value and cost to the American taxpayer. A PLA is a proven, a proven tool to help provide structure and stability to a project, especially on certain large projects, especially on certain large projects. The private sector uses PLAs also for a variety of construction projects similar to those GSA manages. PLAs are also used at the State and local levels for a wide array of construction projects varying in size and scope. PLAs have been used in all 50 States and the District of Columbia. They can help reduce risks associated with wage stability, avoidance of work stoppages, increase labor availability and project-specific coordination of work rules. PLAs can also include provisions that promote career development through valuable job training for construction workers. GSA uses PLAs when they promote economy and efficiency in Federal procurement. Executive Order 13502 and the FAR encourage executive agencies to consider requiring contractors to use PLAs on projects totaling at least $25 million. As Mr. Gordon said, the executive order does not mandate that Federal agencies require PLAs, but encourages the consideration of PLAs. Our procurement process provides for the consideration of PLAs. We allow contractors to submit a proposal with a PLA, without a PLA, or both. We evaluate these proposals on a project-by-project -project basis. If we accept a PLA proposal, the awardee is required to execute a PLA in accordance with the executive order and the FAR. In GSA's contracts, the PLA is an agreement between the contractor and the labor organization, rather than between GSA and the labor organization. As we typically do on, all on, on our major construction projects, GSA selects the proposal with the best value to the government by weighing a number of technical factors against cost. A PLA recently has been included as one of those technical factors. I should note that the other technical factors for many more points are past performance, key personnel, and a management plan, which often includes the, requir the requirement of there being a plan to include small business. Proposals with a PLA receive 10 percent of the 100, 10 of the possible 100 points for technical evaluation. And if you consider that then the technical factors as a whole are balanced against price, on the other hand, you will see that, uh, that the PLA in and of itself is far less than 10 percent, more like probably 5 or 6 percent of total award, and we don't really quantify them that way, which I will be happy to explain. We award to contractors who usually work with labor organizations, and we also award to contractors who do not usually work with labor organizations. 
Shortly after the executive order was signed, GSA received $5.5 billion through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. These funds, which were used principally to help modernize and green our federally owned inventory, provided GSA the opportunity to conduct a PLA pilot program. And I am proud to tell you today that in our spending on the Recovery Act so far, we estimate we have created 16,000 jobs in the American construction industry. For the pilot PLA program, GSA selected 10 projects with budgets of more than $100 million. The selected projects cover seven states and the District of Columbia. Of the 10, seven ended up with PLAs and three did not. From our comparisons, in most instances, it appears that there has been little to no cost differences, although I will be the first to tell you in some cases that is hard to tell. Our experience in this pilot program has shown us that our bidding process has not hindered competition. In all of our projects, we received sufficient bids to ensure adequate competition and the best value to the American taxpayer. We typically receive between three and eight offers for our projects, for the pilot projects. Through the construction of these projects, GSA plans to assess the use of PLAs for future implementation of best practices and updates to our policies. This pilot program has enabled GSA to obtain real market data regarding the impact of PLAs on competition. We have recently reached out to contractors and union officials to hear their feedback on our pilot projects in order to develop ways to further improve our PLA procurement process. Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee, this concludes my, concludes my prepared statement. I am, of course, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Peck. Uh, Mr. Michaels. Uh, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify about the important work of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and to listen to your suggestions about how we can improve the approaches we take to fulfill the important mission given to us by Congress, protecting the lives and health of American workers. In the four decades since the OSHA Act was enacted, the Nation has made dramatic progress in reducing work-related deaths and injuries. Since 1970, workplace fatalities have been reduced by more than 65 percent. Reported occupational injury and illness rates have decreased by over 67 percent since 1973. But far too many preventable injuries and fatalities continue to occur. I am also glad that you chose the important issue of construction safety. The safety of construction workers is one of OSHA's top concerns. Construction is among the most dangerous industries in the country, and construction inspections comprise 60 percent of OSHA's total inspections. In 2009, preliminary data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics indicate that there were 816 fatal on-the-job injuries to construction workers, more than in any other single industry sector, and nearly one out of every five work-related deaths. But we are talking about much more than just statistics here. We hear about these tragedies almost every day in the news. Almost every construction worker that dies leaves behind a family whose lives are devastated. A breadwinner's serious injury can throw a family permanently out of the middle class. It is clear that OSHA enforcement and regulations save lives, that many workers are alive today because of OSHA's activity. Since its creation 40 years ago, OSHA has relied on the same basic strategies to ensure the safety of American workers. For those many employers who want to do the right thing, we offer compliance assistance and cooperative programs. For those employers who endanger workers by cutting corners on safety, we believe in strong enforcement. The ultimate goal of OSHA's enforcement is deterrence. Using penalties is one way to change employer behavior with the goal of preventing injuries, illnesses and deaths before they occur. Strong enforcement not only benefits workers, but it also levels the playing field for the vast majority of employers who play by the rules and who make health, the health and safety of their employees a priority. Failing to prevent injuries, illnesses and fatalities is a major burden on the American economy. Every year, the, the most disabling injuries cost American employers more than $53 billion, over $1 billion a week in workers' compensation costs alone. Indirect costs to employers, workers and their families can double these costs. One of the primary duties that Congress gave OSHA was to issue standards to protect workers from these costly in injuries and deaths. OSHA goes through an extensive public consultation process before issuing new standards. We conduct sophisticated reviews of the economic impact of proposed regulations. We hold stakeholder meetings and online webinars. And we elicit the input of small employers through the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act, that's the brief of panels for major regulations. We then hold public hearings and we solicit extensive written comments. Finally, 
All of our significant regulatory proposals and final standards are extensively re re reviewed by the Office of Management and Budget. I will go off script here. Mr. Baskin uh, referred to a, a tragedy in Iowa in 2006 where a worker was killed in a crane collapse. At that point, OSHA was working on a new crane standard. It started in 2000, and only last year, in December, in November 2010, did our new crane standard finally go into effect after all those multiple opportunities for public input. And we now have a strong crane standard which we know will prevent deaths like that from occurring. OSHA is a full-service organization. Our strong compliance assistance programs operate under the belief that every employer should have access to the knowledge he or she needs to provide a safe workplace, and every employee should be aware of their basic rights under the law and the hazards they face. In addition to the numerous fact sheets, guidance documents, and online tutorials that can be found on OSHA's website, our on-site consultation program provides free workplace safety and health evaluations and advice to small businesses that cannot afford to hire their own safety and health experts. This program is completely separate and independent from OSHA's enforcement program. Last year, the consultation program conducted over 30,000 consultation visits, more than 9,000 in small construction companies. OSHA also has compliance assistance specialists in every area office. OSHA's strong commitment to compliance assistance is evidenced by the President's request in his fiscal year 11 and fiscal year 12 budgets to increase funding for this on-site consultation program. Finally, I know this committee is interested in why OSHA has temporarily withdrawn its musculoskeletal disorder column proposal in order to solicit more comment, and why we withdrew our proposed noise reinterpretation in order to take a more comprehensive approach to preventing work-related hearing loss. In brief, these actions stand as an example of this administration's willingness to respond to public concern about our programs. I will be, willing to answer, I will be glad to answer any questions about these actions or any other OSHA initiatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Michaels. And I, and I do want to get to that uh, in, a, in a few minutes here um, on, the, on the noise uh, regulation. But let me start with Mr. Peck. Mr. Peck, what percent of Federal uh, contracts come through your uh, agency? And do, do you know, or, and what is the overall dollar amount that you award in, in construction contracts? Do you, do you have those, th that data? I, I don't have the number of uh, our, our percent of uh, even construction product, products in the Federal Government. I can tell you in a, in a typical year, <coughs> Uh, major construction, depending on how much money Congress gives us uh, in our capital program, we are somewhere between uh, usually a billion and a billion and a half if you include new construction and major alterations. Mr. Gordon, in his testimony, talked about the flexibility that the FAR uh, rule has uh, and provides for agencies and how that is implemented. Um, isn't it true that GSA has, has decided that the that project labor agreement is an important part of, a, of the consideration in, in awarding contracts? Well, as, as I said, we have actually uh, run a pilot program on 10 of the projects that we had under the Recovery Act that were over $25 million. That is 10 out of 57 mm -hmm. projects that were only over $25 million. We, we, as I said, we are using them as a test to see uh, whether and how we should implement PLAs on our projects. So that is our record to date, sir. And, and what have you found? Um, well, as I said, so far is, you have to know that uh, we don't have the products that we have awarded on, uh, the, the one that was awarded the first is a little over a year under construction, so we have not completed the project yet. So it is hard to make a determination there. What we can tell you is that we, on all of our PLA bids, we got adequate competition, the same kind of competition we get on most construction well, projects. But how does it work? How, we have heard that. How do you weight uh, a, a and encouraging of PLOs. How do you weight that and, and preference that in the, in the bid process? So in our, uh, again, let me just reiterate, on the 10 projects that we have done a pilot on, we included as one of the technical factors in our bid uh, considerations the, uh, uh, a, um, a, a PLA, a willingness of a contractor to offer us a contract with a PLA, and we balance that. We take that as 10 points out of 100 on the technical factor. So, so 10 percent. And balance that, no, sir, and balance that against the price that we are offered. And so, in essence, we are trying to let the market tell us how it values the use of a PLA. So, so I, I guess I am not following. You are waiting at 10 percent. It seems to me you are saying we are waiting at 10 percent, but we are not. I mean, that is correct. Which, that's, well, that's, well, I, I, so explain that, sir, then. Maybe that is so why I am confused. Someone on the first panel 
suggested that if someone bids $100, we are taking 10 percent off the top of that for a PLA bid, and that is absolutely not true. Well, then how is the 10 percent defined? I will try. Here is, you know, the government does not on construction projects. Um, some time ago, we all realized that just going low bid, while it sounds good, um, hardly any of us buy things that way. And the government, when we used to do what we called low bid, we would often find ourselves with a low bidder who couldn't carry out the project for that low bid, and we ended up often not getting that, that value, and we would end up having to do, take the project to someone else, or they would file delay well, so well, let me ask it this way, then. So, someone who was not willing to enter into a PLA, how can they make up for the 10 percent you wait for those who are in, willing to enter into a PLA? Well, in fact, on, t on 10 of the pilots that we have run, uh, uh, of the 10, three came, uh, three have awarded three of them without PLAs. So it, it seems quite clear that you can, under our process, come in with a non-PLA okay, bid well that, and win it. Well, that brings me to the question I asked the last panel. Uh, according to Mr. Biagas, 6 percent of, uh, and I understand there is a variation in size and some union contractors are bigger and there is a size component when you are doing this evaluation projects this large. I get that. But he indicated 6 percent of, of construction companies in Virginia are union. And yet you are telling me 70 percent of the, uh, so 90, but 94 percent aren't. So, and you are telling me 70 percent of the 10 you have studied were awarded to the 6 percent out there. Is that well, right? Well, but there's a, there's Is that a, right? Uh, no, sir. Though that is not correct, because we did not award, awarding a PLA does not mean you are awarding a contract to a union construction company, to a closed shop company. We are, uh, we are awarding our PLAs to In the vast majority of cases, it, it, I would assume in most cases it does, based on, on, on uh, Mr. Baskin's testimony in the last panel. That is not, well, He said most of his members won't enter into a PLA because of it, it, what it means for their workforce. Well, that, I, I, you know, I couldn't quite tell what he was talking about. I can just tell you that we have the facts of, what, of who we have awarded to. And in this market, and you just told me in that market, 70 percent were, this were market, PLA uh, uh, awarded projects. Yes, sir. In, in this market, let's just talk okay, about Okay. So of those 70 percent, how many were union, how many were non-union? Do, do you have that fact? Um, I don't, but I can that tell you That would be helpful the, based on what you are telling me. But I can tell me. you of the two that have been awarded in this market, they were, they were both to firms that well, there were three, I am sorry. The, all three were to firms that are not union contractors. This, this area does not have very many closed, if any, closed shops anymore. Well, we knew that. Mr. Biagas told us that in the first panel. But that is right. And so we awarded contracts with PLAs to non-union contractors. Awarding a PLA does not mean you are awarding a contract to a union contractor. Let me ask you one last question. To a then I do want to get to, uh, to the ranking member, and I, I apologize. We will we'll give the ranking member an additional minute as well. Um, on your list of PLA, non-PLA projects, it identifies the GSA headquarters building as a no PLA. Correct. Wasn't this originally awarded as a PLA project? Yes, it was. And so what that, happened? Well, you know, the, as I said, we allow the, we asked the, we awarded to the contractor who said he could get a PLA. In the end, uh, after we awarded, he was not able to reach agreement with the union, and so we issued a notice to proceed without the PLA. I think it shows our flexibility. We are not hell-bent for giving for But, but it also raises time. the question, did it discriminate because you initially awarded it and he said he could be get, enter into a PLA agreement, and his competitor bidding, who is not willing to enter into a PLA agreement, i.e., a nonunion construction firm, did they get prejudice in the bid process? Because now, obviously, the one who said he was going to do it and is not doing it still has the contract. That is probably an important question that the taxpayers want to know the answer that's, to. That is a, that's a fair question, and I will be happy to provide for you the record and analysis of, of who, bid, who bid how on that product. I don't believe in this case you will find that to be the case. I don't think you will find that to be the case in, our, you have in the instance the, of our building. Okay. That would be very helpful for the committee. The ranking members recognize. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, listening to Mr. Peck's testimony and, and your questions, where uh, it is clear that PLAs are used for jobs that involve unions and some that are not unions. Uh, the, uh, Linda Figg, who was a witness on a previous panel, uh, I guess was somehow involved in creating this very beautiful brochure about the new I-35 bridge. And as I asked her in the questions, um, she responded that this was a project labor agreement. Yes. I, I didn't ask her if it was union or not, I just said it was a project labor agreement. She said yes. So, Commissioner Peck, as you know, 
in awarding a public contract, it is of the most importance that taxpayers are getting the best value for their investment. In fact, in your written testimony, you state that in selecting a contractor for award, GSA uses the best value method of award, which takes into consideration both cost and technical qualifications. Can you elaborate on the uh, best value method? Yeah, thank you. Um, as I said, it is not a low bid method because it allows us to take quality into account. I always, I always say to people, you know, if, if cost was the only, the only factor, we would all be driving Yugos. Um, people take quality into account. And what this allows us to do is have, we have a panel of, uh, of government uh, experts who take a look at the submissions that contractors make, and they are required to submit such technical factors as their past performance on government and other projects, the key personnel they are putting on a project, their plan for performance on the project, which, by the way, as I said, could include a small business plan. And uh, we then decide who on technical factors is the best. Then we look at the bids that they have given us, and, we, and our panel makes a decision about whether the, whether the technical factors um, are, are outweigh the outweigh the dollar bid or or vice versa. Well, and it, you know, it we, can go we've heard, ways. but we have heard witnesses here today say that PLAs drive up the cost premiums of uh, public projects. And in your experience, have you seen that PLAs have a significant impact on the cost premium of a specific project? Well, I, yeah, I can answer this in a. It's a, a great question. We we've had. Can a, you give me a yes or no? Yes, sir. There? I no, sir. Because that would be it would it would be misleading to get to give a yes or no, and I hope but I hope I'll give you a straight answer. On on a number of our projects, we got PLA and non PLA bids that were exactly the same. On two of our projects, we paid more for the the bid with the PLA was more than the bid without. But on at least but on but I have but I say again, some of the selections are made not just on whether there's a PLA or not. But as near as we can tell, isolating it, we can tell on two products. We paid some kind of a, of we paid more for the PLA, and our panel decided, in in essence, that there was, or we decided that there was a a, a value to that. What was, on, the, what was the value? In um, in both cases, we we thought that the the PLA itself on a project that was a complex, long term project, and this is when people usually find PLAs to be of most value, it was worth spending a little more. It's the it's the reason that you'll find but that that sounds nebulous. Where was the value? Do you remember the? Sure. The value. Well, the the you know the value of a PLA is that particularly where you need highly skilled labor, you have a steady source of labor. You know. Okay, you know, that's what I want to get at. Get get specific. Okay. And there are, um, you know, we we definitely are trying to guarantee against work stoppages where there are projects on which there are lots of different trades involved. You know, even on projects, I have to say this, even on projects that don't have PLAs that you might say are awarded to a non-union contract, there are trade crafts in which the people who work for the non-union contractor are members of unions. And so it is useful on a lot of projects to have an agreement with all of the labor unions about how they are going to coordinate vacation time, hours, overtime, all those sorts of issues. And on those products, uh, as I said, we found that there was value to I it. I want to go over one other point here, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Peck, uh, some of the witnesses on the first panel expressed concern that the use of PLAs inhibits members of the construction industry from competing for government contracting opportunities. Now, in your written testimony, uh, Mr. Peck, you state, quote, by using our optional bidding process, GSA does not discriminate against contractors. GSA awards to contractors who work with labor organizations as well as contractors who work without such organizations. Have you found that PLAs limit competition for government contracts? Well, not that we have seen. And uh, can you elaborate on that? How, yes. how GSA has found that PLA bidding process has not hindered competition? Yes, sir. On the uh, as I said, on the ten pilot projects that we've had, we've gotten between three and eight bids, and that's about the same number we get typically on our large construction products because they're large. We we can't have mom and pop uh, firms as our as our general contractors. We certainly have small firms as subcontractors to those, but that's about the competition that we typically get on our construction projects. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. Will recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our um, members of the panel this afternoon. Uh, thanks for bearing with us through the vote, um, <laughs> Mr. Peck. My first question goes to you, and it's a follow-up to the chairman's question. You mentioned in your opening statement that some contracts are awarded to union 
shops and some are not. Now, just to clarify, if my question is the same as the Chairman's, can you give us a number as to how many go to a union shop and how many go to a non-union shop? Oh, of the, of the, again, of the 10 uh, products that we have awarded, is that what you are talking about, ma'am? Overall. Okay. Of the, I, I, that's a letter, a number I'll have to provide you for the record. Okay, that would be. But, great. but as, as the committee has noted, the vast majority of major of general contractors in this country are not union shops. The uh, the next question is to uh, Mr. Michaels, and uh, welcome. I must say, as I interview and talk to a lot of the small businesses and businesses in my district, OSHA is tends to be one of the impediments, then one of the obstacles that they are always trying to get around. So I hope that we can flesh out some of the issues today. And we would like to make you more user friendly for our, for our business people, because they are the job creators, and that is what this committee is about. So um, you mentioned in your opening statement about um, compliance and this, the uh, compliance assistance that OSHA offers to businesses. Now, my understanding is that OSHA just recently cut uh, the budget for the Voluntary Protection Program. And it seems to me that would indicate that you are moving away from compliance and more to something punitive when it comes to uh, enforcement. Um, no, that is actually not true. There was a proposal uh, to do that, but uh, the current administration proposal is to maintain VPP at the same funding levels. And I have made a commitment to the program. In fact, um, I think if you look at my particular record, I have a real commitment to the program. I ran that VPP program when I was at the Energy Department some years ago. Uh, so I am doing what I can to make sure that program thrives. But beyond VPP, you know, which is a relatively small number of companies and very few small companies, uh, we are trying to push those, the, the basic concepts of, that VPP has embraced. Um, down to all employers, especially the small employers. And so we have a tremendous amount of compliance assistance uh, materials. We have a you know, website that gets 183 million hits a year with information for employers. Uh, and we have this program that we fund through the States, an on-site free consultation program. And we find that many small employers don't know about it. And so, for example, in New York State, it's run by the New York State Labor Department, but it's independent from OSHA. We just fund it. So we, we really like to encourage members, when they hear from their, from their constituents, to say, have you looked at this program to get some free help so you can essentially have your hazards abated before OSHA comes in or before someone's hurt? Thank you. And, Mr. Peck, my last question is for you in the time that I have left. Has GSA ever conducted a study that looks at these PLA agreements and determines the impact, um, whether it is price-wise or any otherwise, uh, in, in the benefit or the, the uh, not-so-good uh, PLA contracting? Um, uh, Ms. Burkle, we, we, have not con we have not conducted a, a study of their, of their effectiveness through the, throughout the course of a construction project, because these are, these are new to us. We have just, uh, just begun awarding them. We are tracking the projects as they, as they go forward to completion. They take a couple of years to complete. And at the end of that, we hope to have some good data on whether they provided us the, the benefits that we uh, thought they, they would. So there was never a, a study done specifically on the Lafayette Federal Building or the Department of Homeland Security at uh, St. Elizabeth's campus in Washington? No, the, I'm, I'm sorry. The, we, have con we conducted a study. Uh, we began a study um, in 2009, I believe it was, to see, to, uh, that looked forward to complying with the executive order before the FAR was done. And we started to look market by market at the pilot areas that we were looking at. For example, we are doing a project in Cleveland, we are doing a project in Denver. And we did uh, have a contractor look at those labor markets to see if they could come up with a formula that would tell us how we could, on a project by project basis, evaluate the PLAs. And first of all, if you could provide that study to the committee, I would appreciate that. But beyond that, we, we will do that. Can you just disclose what the findings of that study showed? On the on all the projects for those two that I cited. I'm sorry, Lafayette and it was Lafayette and Department of Homeland Security at St. Elizabeth's campus. Um, I do not recall on the St. Elizabeth's campus. So I'll provide that for the record. On on Lafayette, the study which which. Well, we didn't quite complete. Did question whether there were, whether a PLA would be valuable on that project. Very good. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. 
The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my, my question goes to Dr. Michaels. And I am in a private business, so I have dealt for years with, with OSHA. Uh, I, I was a little bit confused. In, in your written testimony, there is a statement in there that the fines have not been increased since 1990. Is that uh, con Congress, uh, excuse me. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Congress uh, limited our fines, the maximum level for a fine for a serious violation to $7,000. We have some discretion within that $7,000 to reduce the level of the fine, which we do on the basis of the, being a small employer, a history of lack or, or a presence of OSHA violations, and good faith. But that $7,000 max, maximum is not inflation adjusted and hasn't been changed in almost 20 years, actually in 20 years. So the, the figure that I was looking at, then, the, the, uh, the average OSHA fine for a serious violation in 2010 was only around $1,000? That is correct. That is correct. I know. It is shocking, isn't it? We have I sign letters for a fatality investigation where the, the fine is $2,400. In fact, the average fine last year 2000, in 2010 for a fatality was a, four for the, a violation in connection to a, a fatality was $4,000. It is quite small. I, 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 I'm trying to understand that. How do, how, who defines what's serious and what's not serious? I mean, so, um, serious. We, we have an extensive field operations manual. Serious is that the hazard could result in death or serious bodily harm. So certain um, violations are not serious, and certain, if a serious violation where someone could be killed or be hurt, is you know w could get up to a seven thousand dollar fine. Though it's very rare that we actually, for any violation, issue a seven thousand dollar fine. And so part of part of the determination is, uh, did I say, hear you say the history of the company, its safety record, and the size? size. We, we always discount for a small employer. Yes. Okay. And, and the other thing, and, and if I heard you correctly, did, did you tell me that the value of protect or the voluntary protection program is still in effect and is not going to be cut? It hasn't in our FY two thousand ten budget. It, it is protected. We are now in a uh, continuing resolution where we continue to, at our 2010 levels. In the President's um, 2012 proposed budget, it is maintained at that level as well. And we actu actually end for, ask for an increase in the funds for consultation for small employers. Okay. Well, I hope you continue that, because being a, a small employer myself, I mean, it is nice to be involved. Because I don't think there's anybody that goes out there, runs a business, thinks, you know what, I'm going to operate unsafely and maybe make a couple extra dollars, but put my people at risk. I don't know of anybody in business that does that. So, and I have worked for years with OSHA and a lot of different things. And while we may not think it's it's burdensome and it's overregulating, I got to tell you from the guy that has to write the check, sometimes it makes no sense to me. And I got to tell you, I have a body shop. I have a body shop. OSHA came in and made me put a railing around the top of the paint room. My question was, how in the world would anybody even get up there? And they said, that is not the problem. There is enough space between the top of your paint room and the ceiling that somebody could get up there and possibly fall. So, listen, I, I think you, which the, the intention of all of us is to do a good job. It is the unintended consequences of some of this. And depending on who it is that comes to your store, they don't all look through the same lenses as, as maybe as you think they do. So, I appreciate you being here today and thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania. We will now go to the ranking member, the gentleman from Maryland. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate <clears throat> you calling this hearing today. And to, uh, part of the title of the hearing, as we were understanding it, was to address the OSHA standards. And on the first panel, we uh, had an industry representative, some of which are record identified on OSHA standards as being impediments to job creation and business. Um, but a little bit earlier, Ms. Spear um, submitted for the record a letter from a woman named Tammy Miser. And I would like to use my time to make sure that her voice is heard. I would like to read excerpts from a statement submitted by her, by uh, Ms. Miser of Kentucky, who lost her brother in a factory explosion. And I, I just want to just read this because it is very chilling, particularly with the gentleman just talking about OSHA. He says, My brother Sean Boone worked at the Hayes LaMerritt's plant in Huntington, Indiana, where they made aluminum wheels. The plant had a history of fires, but workers were told not to call the fire department. My brother and a couple of coworkers went into relight a chip melt furnace. 
they decided to stick around a few minutes to make sure everything was okay, and then went back to gather tools. Sean's back was towards the furnace when the first explosion occurred. Someone said that Sean got up and started walking towards the doors when there was a second and more intense blast. The heat from the blast was hot enough to melt copper piping. Sean did not die instantly. He laid on the floor, smoldering while the aluminum dust continued to burn through his flesh and muscle, muscle tissue. The breaths that he took burned his internal organs and the blast took his eyesight. Sean was still conscious and asking for help when the ambulance took him away. We drove five hours to Indiana, wondering if it really was Sean, hoping and praying that it wasn't. This still brings about guilt because I would not wish this feeling on anyone. We arrive only to be told that Sean was being kept alive for us. The on-site pastor stopped us and told us to prepare ourselves, adding that he had not seen anything like this since the war. The doctors refused to treat Sean, saying that even if they took his limbs, his internal organs, organs were burned beyond repair. This was apparent by the black sludge they were pumping from his body. I went into the burn unit to see my brother. Maybe someone who didn't know Sean wouldn't have recognized him, but he was still my brother. You can't spend a lifetime with someone and not know who they are. Sean's face had been cleaned up and it was very swollen and splitting, but he was still my bub. My family immediately started talking about taking Sean off the life support. If we did all agree, I would be ultimately giving up on Sean. I would have taken his last breath, even if there was no hope and we weren't to blame. I still had to make that decision, to watch them stop the machines and watch my brother die before my eyes. But we did take, take him off, and we did stay to see his last breath. The two things I remember most are Sean's last words. I'm in a world of hurt, he said and then he took his last breath. The United States Chemical, uh, Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board said that the explosion that killed Sean probably originated in a dust collector that was not adequately vented or cleaned. The dust collector was also too close to the aluminum scrap processing area. Hayes Lemerts management allowed dust to accumulate on overhead beams and structures which caused a second more massive explosion. The CSB concluded that had the company adhered to the National Fire Protection Association standard for combustible metal dust, the explosion would have been minimized or prevented altogether. The CSB warned OSHA in 2006 about combustible dust hazards. Had the National Fire Protection Association standard been implemented as a mandatory regulation instead of a voluntary consensus code, my brother Sean may, and many others would still be here today. A one-sided look at the costs of OSHA rules, but excluding the benefits, does, does a disservice to workers, responsible employers and families and communities. Uh, Mr. Michaels, uh, um, do you think that we can have a productive uh, discussion today about the impact of OSHA regulations without involving people like Tammy? Uh, you know, I think it is very important to hear from people like Tammy Miser and the, the families of workers who have been hurt. You know, every day OSHA saves lives. There was just an uh, OSHA inspector in Ohio last week, two weeks ago, Rick Burns, who went out to, um, who was called, to, um, and he was told there was someone doing a trench job down a different town. He went over there and saw a man in, in the trench. The trench was 10 feet deep. He said, you better get out of that trench immediately. And the man got out. Five minutes later, that trench collapsed. If he, if he hadn't been there, that, that man would be dead. But we don't hear from his family. We don't, you know, we unfortunately hear from the people who, um, at employers who didn't follow OSHA standards, and there are far too many of those. And so what we are trying to do is make sure that you know, we can get out there, we can have stronger standards to ensure that, that um, more people like well, Tammy don't have to come in. Uh, Mr. Michaels, was this terrible accident um, tragedy, um, was, was it a result of uh, not having the right standards in place or the, 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 the 
company not following the standard that was in place? Well, in that case, in that, I don't know the specific stuff, but most dust explosions, and there have been some terrible dust explosions recently, and a well-known one, Imperial Sugar, down in, in, Florida, in Georgia, killed several workers. Um, there was one recently in West Virginia, or Virginia. Um, two different things. One is generally the violation of numerous OSHA housekeeping standards. What OSHA is now doing is trying to essentially put out a standard that makes much more clear what they have to do. But in that case, it, you know, it is very well known what can be done. And in those cases, we find so, Again, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't that in, in any, it wasn't a failure to have a regulation in place that is going to help with safety. It was a failure of someone not to follow it. So it wasn't this idea we need more regulation. Well, OSHA. It, yes or no? Uh, we do need more regulation because it is clearer to employers uh, what they can do. But the obligation under the well, wait, wait, let me just yeah. be clear. Is it, are you saying we need clarification no, you, or we need more regulation? You need more regulation. Really? But Yes, you need to, some. You need clarity. It has to be very. Employers say, "Well, what should we?" Well, well you're do? saying both things. Yeah. You're saying clarity. You're saying more regulation. Well, the regulations give you clarity. Without a regulation, the OSHA law says an employer has the obligation to provide a workplace free of recognized serious hazards. But then they say, "What's a, what's so a?" So let me ask hazard? you this: and If, if yeah. indulgence of the committee, yeah. and we can go yeah. a second round quickly with everyone if we'd like. Um, Let us go to the rule. I, 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 I talked to you before yeah. we started today's hearing, or the second half of today's hearing. Uh, the, the decision that OSHA made relative to the noise regulation, wh 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 walk me through the process there. Sure. Well, actually, the, that because, was. Because, I mean, let okay. me back up one second okay. and preface it by saying that we heard from manufacturers who are very. I have been in their plants. Uh, we heard from a, a, an individual in my, my, our home, yeah. home county, um, and she runs a very successful uh, business. And I have been in the, in the play. You, you know, you put the ear thing, the ear protection, everything, but now she's talked about they were going to have to have guards up and barriers up and everything else. This is according to the, a constituent of ours. So, so walk me through it. Well, th that is an interesting example because that is not actually a change in the regulation. We have a noise standard that says anything above 90 decibels, you actually have to use engineering controls because we know that earmuffs and earplugs don't always work. But for the last 20 or so years, we have said to employers, we are not going to enforce our standard. We are going to essentially allow you to use, instead of engineering controls, you can use earmuffs. But we know earmuffs don't work well enough. There are 20 to 25,000 new cases of hearing loss reported every year, and that is a vast underestimate. We know that most construction workers develop hearing loss by the time they are retired from work. It is very clear. And we want construction workers, we want all workers to be able to hear their grandchildren when they, you know, when they are old enough to have grandchildren. And so we, we have to do something. When we what we did was we said we were going to enforce our noise standard like we enforce every other standard. As a propo we proposed that, and we heard from many constituents like yours. And so we said, okay, that is clearly going to be more than we expected. We are going to step back and think about other ways. Because you know, in the last 20 years, there are a huge number of new technologies. There are a lot of very inexpensive things that employers can do to reduce noise. And we are mm -hmm. going to work with them, work with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to get more compliance materials out. Because we really do want to reduce noise exposure, but we recognize now is not the time to change our enforcement mm -hmm. rules. So. Well, uh, does the gentleman from uh, the ranking member wish additional time for questions? And you're welcome to, because I think Ms. Ms. Perkle does. Just so the gentleman knows, Ms. Perkle does want to ask some, some follow-ups. Actually, uh, if it pleases the chair, I, I do have a follow-up with Dr. Michaels. Would that be okay? Sure. Uh, Dr. Michaels, I want to go back to the testimony of Tammy Miser that was discussed earlier. Through her testimony, Ms. Miser illustrates that OSHA regulations not only save lives, but they save businesses too. She gives the example of the 2009 ConAgra plant explosion in North Carolina. The explosion occurred because a contractor was purging national ga uh, ga uh, natural gas into the indoor work environment. Now, there is currently no OSHA, as you know, <clears throat> no OSHA regulation for natural gas purging. Three workers were killed, 71 workers were injured. Now, before the explosion, 700 people worked at the factory, and today the factory is shutting down. 700 lost jobs because a workplace disaster. 700 people would be working and three families who would not have been torn apart had there been more regulation. Now, Ms. Meiser also gives the example of the 2007 explosion of a Jacksonville, Florida gasoline additive factory. The explosion killed four, injured 32, including 28 at surrounding businesses. Pieces of the building were found a mile away. A subsequent investigation revealed that the explosion could have been prevented if OSHA's process safety management standard covered reactive hazards. 
So three businesses that were adjacent to the factory were forced to relocate. A fourth was forced to completely shut down. You know, we talk about lives that would have been saved and jobs that would have been preserved had there been regulation. Now, Dr. Michaels, do you agree with uh, Ms. Miser that OSHA regulations not only can save lives but also can save businesses as well? Yes, I do. And I, you know, I, know, <clears throat> I know that you have touched on this in your written testimony, but would you um, elaborate when you look back to see a history of OSHA regulation being overly burdensome to industry? Well, you know, there have been studies on this, and the Office of Technology Assessment, which was a branch of Congress, actually studied eight OSHA regulations in 1995. The study is very valid. There have been very few OSHA regulations since then. And they went back and they looked and they found for the most part, there was one exception that was questionable, but the other seven, the um, companies were able to meet those regulations without hurting their, their own profitability, without um, hurting their productivity. And in fact, there are some very clear examples where the OSHA regulations, which were opposed by industry, end up saving jobs and saving money. The, the best example is vinyl chloride. You know, this is, vinyl is the product you know, widely used. In 1974, it was discovered to be a carcinogen. And OSHA said, there were, you know, we have to essentially protect workers from those exposures. Industry said more than a million jobs would be lost. But OSHA went ahead, they issued a standard saying they essentially had to fully control exposure in these major facilities. The industry very quickly figured out how to do that. Not a single job was lost, as far as I can tell. The industry, the headlines in the business papers were, you know, vinyl industry, you know, celebrates in triumph. They were able to enclose the material, save money, and move forward. And so we always hear, and it's understandable, every industry says, you know, it's going to cost us too much money because they don't try. And so we want to work with industry to try to say, we can save you money, we can save jobs. Look, the clean energy explosion last Super Bowl Sunday, which killed six workers, injured 50, it, it destroyed a billion dollar natural gas um, power plant that has to be rebuilt from scratch. I thank the gentleman. Thank you. Let me just ask the gentleman, you, you said earlier uh, when I was questioning that you think we need more regulation. There are areas that we don't have regulation that we need regulation on. So the, the, the gentleman's testimony is you think we need more regulation? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're now, and you would also argue, and, and I, I understand the example yeah. you talked yeah. about in where science had discovered that this element in, in, in OSHA rules are put forward and actually was, was helpful and beneficial. But you also would, I, I assume, say that there is a compliance cost for business owners uh, relative to regulation. Yes. Okay. Um, need more regulation, there, there, there is a compliance cost. Yes. Okay. And we have to balance those out, obviously. We have to think about both those things. Great. Gentlelady from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that the goal here for this hearing today is really we want a win-win situation where we have safety in the workplace yeah. and we don't deter economic growth and, and hurt job creation. Um, I want to just go back to a statement you just made, because I want to make sure I heard it correctly. In 1995, you said a study was done and on seven regulations? I believe it was eight. Eight, okay. And did you say there haven't been many more regulations added to that? There have been very few major regulations um, in the last 15 years that OSHA has put out. It takes OSHA a long time to put out a regulation. There were a number of years, the George W. Bush administration, where OSHA really had no interest in putting out new regulations. So the only health standard that OSHA put out during that period was on another carcinogen, hexavalent chromium, that the Federal Court said you must put it out. And so there have, it's hard to look at new regulations because there haven't been new regulations to look at. We have issued a new standard on cranes. That is our first big one, and we have a couple of more important ones coming out. Thank you, Dr. Michaels. I want to just talk to you a little bit about this I2P2 regulation that you are um, proposing. If you could just briefly explain what that regulation uh, will entail. This is a very different sort of regulation that where OSHA has a regulation about cranes and says this is how to operate your crane or how, you know, what to do about fall protection. This is telling employers, we don't want to tell you how to do it, but we want you to think about your hazards and address them. You know, I looked at um, Mr. Biagas, who was on the first panel here. His website talks about how um, my company, it says, Bay Electric develops a detailed and specific safety plan for each project we perform. We expect that of all employers, to figure out what your hazards are. If it is not a serious hazard, then do whatever is appropriate. But if you have a serious hazard, then you have to address it. So this approach, which is actually what VPP is, um, essentially says you have to think about your hazards in a systematic way. 
Now, this is, we're very early in the process. We're still considering it. We haven't started the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act process. So there will be lots of opportunity for people to have input um, and talk to us about it. But we think this will be more effective than trying to do st standards on every specific hazard, because we can't have a standard on every hazard. There are so many different things out there. And so this is, this is telling employers, you figure it out. We trust you. You know more about it than anybody else. But you have to figure it out. You have to think about it. And we hope you will support that and ask us more about it later on. Well, when we see it, we will consider it. Uh, with I2P2, what are the, the uh, penalties that you are talking about with, if, for a violation of that? Well, we, we haven't gotten anywhere near that yet. I mean, we are just we're, we're so early in the process. Um, but I know that one thing that, that um, industry is um, concerned about is sort of the double penalty. And we want to make sure we are not trying to make this an onerous requirement that just to see the opportunity to issue more penalties. We, will, we want to work with employers to make sure that they see the purpose of this and they see it is really separate from the you know, we still have all of our rules that issue penalties for violation of different standards or just not providing a safe workplace. This really is very different. Well, so what, what are the employers hearing or seeing if this is so new in development? What are they hearing or seeing that they are concerned about a double penalty? Well, well frankly, you know, it is hard for me to tell. I know that a couple of big trade organizations that oppose everything OSHA ever does, they came out and they opposed it. But I think that is to raise money from their constituents. Because I hear from employers every day who say, this, this, is, you know, this is obvious. Of course, we, we do this every day. Every employer does this, and we will support you. So um, we will have to see. You know, Obviously, some are concerned, but I think some just like to raise red flags. I think if you know, we're asking them, work with us, bring your concerns to us. Don't announce you're opposed to it before you, you see, before you even see it, because I'm, that's what I'm hearing. There are some people who have already said, well, we're opposed to it. And that's I don't think that's right. And with this I2P2 regulation, do you think that that's going to take us away from the compliance um, assistance and more to the punitive, or you think it's going to be more? Well, user friendly. You know, we do both. That's the thing. We, we, for employers who want to do the right thing, who want to do this, we will give them all the help we can. But there are always going to be some that don't. And so we have enforced. We'll, we're going to do both. We're not. It's not one or the other. How how do you know what's right though? Some of these, like what we heard earlier, these are subjective subjective criteria that when you have someone going into the work site, he may have a different standard or a different vision than you have. And how are we going to ensure? a uh, fair and equitable distribution of these regulations? I guess, uh, are you asking specifically about I2P2 or the general balance? I2P2 well, is what we are talking Well, you know, California has had an I2P2 standard for almost 20 years. And employers there are very comfortable with it. So we, we actually are having conversations with, with stakeholders around the country. We have had five big meetings, but also talking directly to the OSHA offices in California, saying, how do you do this? You know, how do you make sure you have got that right balance? And but so again, I will just go yeah. back to my concern, and that would be a fair application of the law oh. and, and the interpretation of the law. And, and I, cer I certainly appreciate that. And Thank you. What gentleman from Maryland. I would <clears throat> certainly agree with the gentlelady. I would think a fair application of the law is so very important, and I will tell my story until I die. As a young boy uh, in high school working in a, at Bethlehem Steel, and after you would blow your nose on being on the property for an hour, when you blew your nose, the mucus was black. A lot of the men who worked with me died early. I just worked there for a summer. Some of them worked there for years. And they, breathe, they would breathe it in and breathe it out, breathe in, and I'm sure their lungs got covered with that stuff. So, you know, I think, you know, I was just wondering, Mr. Michaels, how important, <clears throat> important is enforcement with regard to OSHA regulations? And is inspections a part of that process? It, you know, our basic view of this is we have to, is deterrence. We have to do everything we can to make sure employers do the right thing. You know, the law is about employers. They have to apply the right standards. They have got to protect workers. So we do enforcement. 
and when we do enforcement and it's a significant case, we also try to publicize it and we try to reach out to the industry and say, look, you can do the right thing, you can get the compliance assistance program, but at the same time, if we go there and we find a hazard, we're going to give you a fine. And in many cases, we're going to put in a press release so people see it. And so we know that we want to do everything we can to encourage the right behavior. And we're a small agency, and so we do as much enforcement as we can. We've got about 2,200 inspectors for the whole country to cover 130 million workplaces, you know, uh, 130 million work, 7 million workplaces, 130 million workers. How many, how many inspectors right do you have? Right now, about 2,200. You know, we, with, the, with, the, with the budget cuts, how many will you have? Do you know? Well, the budget cuts will take us down in terms of the number of inspectors to the, to the number of inspectors we had in the early 1970s with a workforce that is pretty much twice as big, if those cuts go through permanently. If the cuts go through in the short run, you know, we, the, you know, if the CR is passed immediately, we would probably have to lay off almost all the, or furlough, almost all the in, enforcement um, personnel we have because the cuts are really focused on our enforcement program and so late in the year that a 20 percent cut on, on the agency focused on enforcement will have a very, very big impact. So um, if we, we don't have to do away with the regulations, we just stop people from, we just fire people or furlough them and they won't be able to do the job. Is that right? That's right. You know, I was very, one of the most interesting articles I've ever written, read, was by Ezra Klein. It, it, it says how House GOP spending cuts would add up to more spending later. And basically, the, it's, uh, it's a very interesting article because what he talks about is on March 14th of this year, he talks about how we're doing all this cutting, cutting, cutting. But it's a, a, an issue of whether you're doing a lot of damage in the process, and, and what you're talking about there. When if this Congress continues to cut, cut, cut all of our enforcement people and our inspectors, you don't have to worry about the regulations because you take the guts out of the regulations by doing that. Am I right? That's right. We know that the thing that drives compliance assistance, the reason employers go and get the free consultation. A big reason is they fear an OSHA inspection. And that's reality. It's unfortunate, but that's, you know, a lot will do it because they want to do the right thing, but they also think, well, I better do this because I don't want to, you know, get a fine. So if, if our inspections disappear, it would have a big impact. And I don't think people would use compliance assistance much either, frankly. And there's another thing that kind of bothered me about the, this whole idea of cost uh, regulations that might cost jobs, job-killing regulations or whatever they call it, and this is my statement, this is not you, this is me, nothing guarantees that even if they got rid of the regulations and even if they saved the money, that that would relate to new jo more jobs. It might just, you don't have to comment on this, might just be more profit. And so, you know, I just think, I'm just, I just hope that we keep sight of this. I mean, this OSHA thing, the reason why I cited my example it's because I'll never forget, gentlemen, how those older men at Bethlehem Steel would beg me to stay in school. Although they were making a lot of money, they said, stay in school. And you know why? Because they knew that I would die early like they would. I yield back. Mr. Michaels, uh, would you agree that the vast majority of employers care, uh, care deeply about the well-being of their employees? I think so. I mean, I don't have evidence, but that's my feeling as well. I mean, particularly in the high-tech world we live in today where there is so much investment in their employees, they put so much money at stake, and they want their employees there because that's, that's how, what keeps their business profitable in this high-tech international marketplace we are in. I, I, would, I would venture to say the vast, vast majority of employers care deeply about their employees. I would like to agree with you. Um, well, well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you think you care more about their employees than the employer who employs them? Is that what you are insinuating? I am not, I'm not suggesting that at all. Do you think a bureaucrat at the Federal Government cares more about the employees no. at Mike Kelly's business than he does? I would never suggest that. Well, that's what, but that is what you were saying when I asked no. you think the vast majority of employers do not care passionately and deeply about the well-being of their employees. I, I just think that is the norm. Well, I think you are right. But I, unfortunately, well, then why didn't you say that when I asked you the question? I, I think I did say that. I don't think you did. You said I would like to think that. 
Well, I, no, I said I, I said I think that. Excuse me, but I think it's also clear that we see employers who they whatever. And you've they also say, said that you also think we need more regulation. Yes. You've also admitted that there is a compliance cost with that regulation. And if you remember the first panel that was in front of the full committee that Chairman Issa had, he had witnessed that we had small businesses uh, owners here, and the question was asked by a freshman member: If you knew then what you know now, would you have started your business relative to regulation? You know what the answer was for most of those, uh, those uh, witnesses? No, I don't. They said no, they would not have started their business. If they knew then all the regulations, all the things they have to deal with with government, they would not have started their business. These are profitable business, employing lots of people. And one was from our district. And I know how, how big of an influence he is in this community that he uh, it comes from. So that is what we are also trying to get at. Yes. Okay. No, I think what we said before is we are looking for the right balance between enforcement, because we have to be cognizant of the fact that if we are not there and, you know, OSHA the employer says, well, this time I don't have to, you know, that man who is getting on the scaffold, today he doesn't have time, I'm going to tell him to skip the safety harness. And that scaffold goes down. Instead of the photograph in the newspaper of the, the worker just hanging there being saved, you know, he's on the ground dead. And we see it too often. So we need that balance. Great. I want to thank the witnesses. I apologize, Mr. Gordon. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Mr. Kelly wanted uh, additional time. And then we will stop here after this. And I, I, I apologize for going so long. Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I got to tell you, I think all of us are trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And the question becomes then, how do you get to the right thing? And, and, and I have got to tell you, I am a private business person. And I understand how difficult it is. I have friends that work at Armco Steel. I have friends that work at Pullman Standard. I have people that work in my shop. You know the biggest problem employers have is workers that won't use the safety. When I go out in the shop, my guys are supposed to wear a hard hat when they have a car up in the air. They are supposed to wear goggles when they have a car up in the air. They are supposed to wear goggles when they use a grinding wheel. What people are supposed to do, whether there is a regulation or not, yep. is kind of secondary. And I know this is purely anecdotal, but everything in these hearings is anecdotal, because we all know a guy who knows a guy who knew a guy. But the question of the hearings were, at some point, is the cost of regulation getting, reaching a level where we can't legislate complete safety. It is just impossible because people's nature is to take the easy way out of everything. I am talking about people that work in the job. I have friends every day that are hurt in the steel mills because they don't follow the safety standards. So are we going to get to a regulation where we have to have somebody who walks with these guys to make sure they do the right thing all the time? And I think the question becomes, where is the end game with regulation? Because you say we need more regulations. The chairman says, are you talking about regulations or are you talking about more clear regulations? And I ask you this, is there any penalty put on a worker other than by his employer not to follow safety standards by OSHA? You know, the OSHA Act is written only giving OSHA only authority to do something about employers. Right. Because it's, See, well, that's my point. Well, no, that's my point. Because yeah. you cannot legislate people using common sense. Don't I wish? Mm -hmm. Don't I wish? It is almost it's like a dog chasing its tail. We keep coming up with new regulations every day to protect people from doing dumb things that they do themselves. I wish there were an answer to all this. I do appreciate you coming here today, but I got to tell you, from a guy who has lived it and who's, who has paid more in training, in equipment, and I see the same things being done by the same people who just got hurt the week by, before and say, what are you thinking about? So I, I'm not putting down what you're doing. My gosh, we, we all want everybody to come to work and, and do, get through the day healthy and go back home. I want to see everybody get to be a grandfather. I'm a grandfather. But I also want to see my business survive, and I don't want it to get to the point where I'm regulated out of business because of something that I can't possibly watch 24 hours a day. It just is impossible. Thank you. Ranking member, the, the, the vice chairman has, has asked for 15 seconds, and then we will adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to comment, because, um, uh, Dr. Michaels, when you were talking about p businesses fearing an OSHA uh, inspection, and I think that is what we are troubled with. OSHA should be working with businesses so we all get to that win-win where we have a safe workplace and we keep uh, jobs in the economy going. Thank you. Again, let me thank our witnesses, and we appreciate Dr. Mr. Gordon. We apologize you didn't get many questions today, but thank you, thank you nonetheless for your testimony and for spending time with us this afternoon. We're adjourned.
Yeah. I don't know if you want to take that on.